God has promised that if we draw near to Him, He'll draw near to us. The Bible tells the story of a father longing to be reunited with his wayward son and of the father's joy when his son finally returns home. This touching illustration reveals God's desire to have us come close to Him. Let's draw near to God, and He will draw near to us. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this special Sabbath morning broadcast. To those in Fort Worth, thank you for coming today. And for those of you joining us live via satellite, if you're watching in a church across the country or around the world, we'd like to extend a very special welcome to you as well. And if you're watching us in your home on 3ABN or ACN or Hope or maybe even online, we'd like to extend a special and warm welcome to you today. Have you been blessed, friends? Has the Holy Spirit spoken to your hearts? I know He has to me. And tonight we expect the Holy Spirit to once more draw us into God's presence. Well, we would like to sing our theme song at this time. What a beautiful song it is. Have you found yourself singing the song during the week? Revive us, Lord. Well, let's stand together as we sing the song, Revive us, Lord. And then Pastor Doug will be sharing with us, Pleading Our Poverty is the theme for this morning. Are we ready? Revive us, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Revive us, Lord, make us like your Son. Revive us, Lord, speak your word so we can hear it. Revive us, Lord, till Remain standing as we kneel on the rostrum for our prayer this morning. It will be offered to us by Pastor Ruben Rodriguez. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with uh, deep uh, and profound gratitude. How can we not uh, be grateful to you? when you have done so many things for us. Lord, you have uh, just called us from the uh, darkness to the light. And in the process, you transform our life. Lord, also you call us to spread the good news, to share with others what you have done for us. And Lord, how can we, can we not be grateful to you when you have uh, given us the opportunity to be part of this revival. 
not only us over here in Fort Worth, Texas, but uh, in this nation and around the world. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be part of this revival. And thank you. Thank you for amazing facts. Thank you for Pastor Bachelor, and thank you for his uh, team and for the difference they have made over here in Texas and around the world. Lord, we just pause for a, mo for a moment to ask you that uh, you bless and be upon Pastor uh, Bachelor as uh, he preached the word today. Use him in such a way that we can understand that you are speaking through him to us. Whatever we are, O oh Lord, in this world, we pray that uh, your Holy Spirit be upon us too in order to understand what uh, you want to tell us and what you want from us. Thank you again for this uh, mighty privilege. Thank you for being part of this uh, um, revival. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Rodriguez. Thank John and Kelly. We have a familiar face back with us again. It's good to be here. I want to thank several people right now, if that'd be okay. Sure. I want to thank 3ABN for bringing their whole crew. They have done just an outstanding job. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank the Southwestern uh, University mm -hmm. and the volunteers that have been helping with this series uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Barb Oliver, I want to especially thank. And uh, this revival here locally is the result of a lot of sacrifice mm -hmm. and dedication. And thank you for coming. Thank you for Amen. watching. Those of you who are watching on TV or listening to the radio. And uh, oh, I want to remember to thank the Texas Conference and uh, the union, everybody here who's been Amen. helping with the series. Now, then uh, while I'm up here, I'll represent uh, all of us uh, here and on the airwaves. We want to thank you. Doug Batchelor and Amazing Facts for all that you do. Thank you, Dan. For the cause of God on this earth. And uh, God bless you and your work. We're hearing tremendous reports, I'm sure, just as you are. And uh, a lot of things are happening, and that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, you're one of those that always says go. And Jesus says go, and you always obey. And God honors uh, and gives you favor. Well, thank you. And speaking of going, uh, Someone brought, how would you like to see about 15 seconds of my second evangelistic series? That was 28 years ago. Someone brought a tape. I did it in Middle Othian, Texas. Mm -hmm. We've been telling. Now, I see the guy in the middle? Hair, or should we wait and yeah, you can I don't, see? See the, right there? Right here, okay. Danny. See the oh, guy right. in the middle with a white shirt? That's Pastor Doug. And then, Why are you laughing? Is, is that a wig or is that... <laughs> I can't say it's that so was good. the real thing, was that, man. That was the real thing. Huh? I'm meeting with my, I'm a lay evangelist, and I was meeting with our first evangelistic, our second evangelistic meeting. I think I was working with Pastor Marvin Moore, who was here last night in the Middle Othian, Texas. And the reason I show that to you, we have been encouraging uh, young people and laymen get involved in Bible work, in soul winning. It is so rewarding. And if I could be doing that back then, and the Lord is blessed, and you could see I was a little rough around the edges. And we baptized 11 people at that little series. Right. And so Amen. get involved in going, in sharing the good news. Amen. That's good. Okay. Time for questions? Okay. All right. Uh, this question says, I know the church does not keep all the old rituals, but um, the first church celebrated the Passover. Why don't we? And says, how and when did we stop that? Well, in reality, we do celebrate the Passover. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was a Passover. And he said, I have longed to eat this Passover with you. And so now we don't really sacrifice a lamb anymore. The Bible says Christ is our Passover. And so whenever we have the Lord's Supper, that is the New Testament version of the Passover now. Instead of taking the literal blood of a lamb and applying it to the door of our house, we apply the blood of Christ to our hearts. Amen? So, in, in reality, we do keep the Passover. Okay. Uh, it says in uh, scripture, uh, reference to scriptures, there are many scriptures that tell us not to be afraid. Uh, and In fact, it encourages us to be courageous and all of those things, but 
this person is asking, but is it a sin to be afraid? I'm, sometimes I find myself still afraid. Well, there are some things it's only wise to be afraid of. I am very reluctant to reach out and grab a live rattlesnake. You hope that you have a healthy fear of that which is harmful. The Bible tells us that we should be God-fearing. So that may sound like a contradiction. And that not only means to awe and respect God. God is so magnificent and so mighty. Uh, he is so awesome that if he were to enter this room with a fraction of his presence right now, it'd be terrifying for us. So it is healthy and normal to have this God-fearing awe. But a Christian should not live in a state of fear and dread. We should live by faith. Keep in mind, it says, the fearful will be cast in the lake of fire. And one of the messages of angels over and over again, fear not, fear not, fear not. I think it was Dwight Moody that counted 365 fear nots in the Bible. That's one for every day of the year. Amen? As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, since we understand prophecy, Daniel and Revelation, we understand that in the end we win. So there's really not that much to be afraid of, right? Just understand in the end, through Christ, we win. We've read the last chapter. We've read the, we've read the back of the book, and it says we win. All Amen. right. Okay, this one, can the prayers of the living help those who are now dead? Well, the Bible is very clear that once a person dies, their works do follow them. It is appointed unto man once to die, after this the judgment, Hebrews. Um, if you're going to pray for somebody, pray for them now. Nothing, no prayers, no intercession here on earth alters a person's destiny once their probation closes, and death is that close. Unless, like Lazarus, they're resurrected and they get to keep living a little longer. But once you enter death and your next conscious thought is a resurrection, you will face your reward. The intercession, prayers, burning candles, that doesn't change that fate. Okay, our next question. Are there unfallen worlds? Could you please uh, explain this? The person says, I, I believe that there are, but I really don't know how to give proof to my friends. Well, in Hebrews chapter 2, I believe it's verse 2, the Lord says, through Christ, God made the worlds. And you know, in the story of Job, it says there was this heavenly meeting where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Job chapter 1, it repeats it, I think, in Job chapter 2. And Satan came also, and God said to Satan, where did you come from? He said, I came from the earth. So here is some cosmic meeting taking place. I believe that God has a countless number of unfallen worlds. Now, there's a parable Jesus tells that gives us a little insight on this. A shepherd has a hundred sheep, and one of them is lost, and he leaves the 99 safe in the fold to go look for that one lost sheep. This world is the only world that is lost, and Christ left all the unfallen beings to come and to seek and save this lost world. And so, uh, obviously, there's angels. We know about that. Cherubim, seraphim, these other creatures that God has in heaven that sing around His throne and praise Him. So, uh, yes, I believe there is unfallen life besides what is here on earth. We are quarantined because of sin. But someday we'll see him face to face and talk to angels and these unfallen beings. Amen. Uh, this one says, if we have committed adultery, have married another, and are still living in this adulterous situation in which no children have been born to the illicit union, is it not biblical that true repentance would not only include our confession of our sin, but dissolving our marriage? In the case when you're married to more than one person at a time, someone's got to go. <laughs> uh, and that's what right. happened with um, Abraham, with Hagar. I mean, it's the one time in the Bible that God basically said, divorce her. The word is put her away, but it translates divorce her. He had two wives. And this is a struggle for some cultures that still have multiple wives. When they convert to Christianity, they say, well, what do I do? I've got wives and children. It is a big problem. But what about someone who's maybe divorced and remarried without biblical grounds, you look at the story of David and Bathsheba. That was a marriage that definitely got off on the wrong foot. And they were punished for that. Am I right? But then, even after the baby died because of their sin, the first child, the Bible says David comforted his wife. It starts out by saying the wife of Uriah. And later it says David comforted his wife and gave them another child who was Solomon. God did not say 
divorce Bathsheba because it started out as an adulterous relationship. God knows that in some cases you can't unscramble scrambled eggs. And you've got to just start where you are. And someone might be wondering, well, should I go back to my original husband or wife? You know, there's actually a place in the Bible that says that if a woman uh, divorces her husband and marries another, she shall not go back to her husband. The land will be defiled. Okay. Uh, we are counseled in the Old Testament that women should not wear that which pertains to a man. Does that mean that women cannot wear slacks? Then it says, number two, how did men's and women's attire in the Bible days differ from each other? All right, the principle that there should be a distinction in the clothing between men and women is what the Lord is communicating there. Uh, virtually every culture of the world, until we got into this unisex culture that we're living in now, there were very clear distinctions in the styles between men and women. And how many of you have noticed that there seems to be some kind of a media push to endorse homosexuality? It's almost like we are all this one big homogenous sex. The very clear, decisive lines between male and female are being blurred in our culture. Am I the only one who thinks that? Do you see that too? And there needs to be a distinction. That distinction doesn't mean that women can't wear pants and men uh, can't wear robes. In the time of Christ, men didn't wear pants. Styles change. There, now, now, some women shouldn't wear pants and certain kinds of pants. And there's some pants men probably shouldn't wear. Uh, the clothing, whatever those styles are, Christians should choose that which is modest and discreet. We've talked about Christian clothing being neat, clean, modest. We should not be given over to flamboyant styles that are ostentatious to attract attention, nor should they be sexually revealing or suggestive. And so when men and women choose their clothing, they should be sensitive that they're not deliberately causing the opposite sex to stumble by being revealing. Are there some modest pants? Yes. So it's not a law against their four pants. It's a distinction between men's clothing and women's clothing. I'm embarrassed to say one day when we were up at our ranch, you want to hear it now that I said I'm embarrassed. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> I reached into a drawer and Karen got her pants mixed up with my pants. And I was in a hurry, wasn't paying attention. I slipped them on. Now, come and on. And I thought, something's wrong. <laughs> there was a distinction. <laughs> Did you wear them out of the house, though, before no, you? No, I, I, I changed right away. I said, hey, this doesn't fit. <laughs> okay. All right. They were very loose in the wrong places. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next question now. God commands us not to murder or kill. Can someone that commits suicide go to heaven? Oh, serious question. And we're asked that a lot. Maybe because of our message on Samson last night, uh, someone is wondering, well, did he commit suicide? I like to emphasize, I believe they were going to execute him that day, and he knew that. And uh, so he laid his life down basically to save others. That's not a suicide, that's a sacrifice. Um, there may be cases. I actually conducted the funeral for a young lady who was very discouraged. She took pills to kill herself, and then as the pills began to take their effect, she called 911. She realized she didn't really want to die. They got her to the hospital. They tried to reverse the effect of the medication, and they could not. And uh, I guess she communicated to the ambulance drivers that she was remorseful for what she had done. She didn't want to do it, and she died. Her birth certificate, I'm sorry, her death certificate is going to say suicide. Could she be saved? Possibly. In most cases, suicides represent a loss of faith and hope. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if anyone out there is considering suicide, think about this for a minute, especially young people. I appeal to you. Sometimes the circumstances seem so discouraging, your life may seem hopeless, and you think, if I commit suicide, I'll end my pain. That is a big lie. If you commit suicide, you actually remove your options, and your next conscious thought is nothing but trouble. So it doesn't improve your circumstances. Suicide seals a bad situation. Life, the Bible tells us, Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Where there's life, there's hope. Amen? One last question. Uh, is any human in heaven now, and does any person go to heaven before the second coming, or is everyone just waiting? Well, we know the Bible teaches that there are some who have experienced a special either resurrection or translation. 
two who went to heaven without dying are, what are their names? Enoch, Enoch and Elijah. The Bible says Enoch was not, for God took him. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. Some have been resurrected, such as Moses. We know he appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, the 24 elders around the throne of God in Revelation could be some of those that were resurrected in Jerusalem during the time of Christ's death and resurrection. So there are some there. We don't know of many more than that. Um, the Bible doesn't specify. There may be others that the Bible simply doesn't record. But generally speaking, the dead, good and righteous, are waiting for the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of damnation, Jesus speaks of, and they are sleeping, a dreamless sleep, waiting for that. We're continuing with our series, 05 Revive, and the theme is Drawing Near to God. And our message this morning, again taken from a story in the Bible, will help highlight that theme of drawing near to God. The message is titled, Pleading Our Poverty. Pleading Our Poverty. And before we turn to the Word of God, I solicit your prayers. I hope you will pray with me, for me, and that that will ricochet back and be a blessing for you. Let's bow our heads. Dear loving Lord, we are coming before you again, asking you to bring these words to life. You've told us that the words that you speak, they are spirit and they are life. We ask that you will use the chosen instrument today. In spite of my flaws and sins, I ask the Holy Spirit might take my mouth and have it be a channel of truth and as a result, hearts will be touched and stirred. We will say within, Lord, what must I do to be saved? So please speak to every heart. And as a result, we pray that we will come with no reservations to Jesus and embrace him and his covenant of salvation. It's in his name we ask. Amen. Amen. I love the Bible stories. The Bible stories are the key to understand the gospel and the theology of Jesus. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Judges, I'm sorry, book of Joshua, Judges was last night, Joshua chapter 9, this is something of a continuation of when we talked about Rahab. Joshua chapter 9, it's the story of the Gibeonites. Now, when the children of Israel were about to take the promised land, Moses had given them some very clear instructions that they were not to enter into any league with the inhabitants, with these pagan nations in the promised land. Matter of fact, they were to completely either annihilate, eradicate, or evict them. They were not to share with them. God had warned them in no uncertain terms they were not to enter into marriages. They were not to allow them to remain because if they did, they would be thorns in their eyes. Matter of fact, let me read this to you from, don't lose your place there in Joshua, but in Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord, verse 1, when the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you go to possess it, and he's cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, Seven nations, isn't that an interesting number? Seven nations greater and mightier than you. They're all greater and mightier than you, but God's going to give you victory over them. Friends, in order for us to take the promised land, we need supernatural help. Amen? Amen. Because the devil and his forces are greater and mightier than us. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, no show, no sh or nor show mercy to them. And by the way, the Gibeonites, that was the people of the Hivites that are mentioned here. Don't miss that. They were not to enter into a covenant. The Lord knew that if they did, they would begin to compromise, you listening? They would compromise their faith. It was God's way or the highway. That may seem a little severe, but that's how the Lord is. He does not compromise truth. And the devil is trying today to get the church to compromise the truth so that we could live more peacefully with the world. God says, no compromise. No covenant. They're out, you're in. Back to uh, Joshua chapter 9. 
Verse 1, And it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan and in the hills and in the lowland and all the coasts of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, they heard of what Joshua had done to the um, Jericho. It really shook them up. Now, keep the perspective. When they were camped across the Jordan River, these nations had spies watching. They knew for 40 years they were on their way to the Promised Land. They knew what their purpose was. And they knew what they had done to the Egyptians. And they could look right across the Jordan Valley and see that pillar of fire there by the, the sanctuary, illuminating their camp at night. And in the morning, they'd see them go out from the camp and to gather their manna. And they knew that God was in their midst. It was very unnerving for them to know that they said, that's our land, we're taking it back. God gave it to Abraham, and you are strangers. And then a little later, they looked over and they saw what happened to the city of Jericho. They knew what was going on there, that somehow God gave them this supernatural victory. They marched around the walls. They simply blew the trumpet and the walls imploded. Everything except the part of the wall where Rahab lived, right? And some of the nations said to themselves, you know, they've got a mighty God and the only way that we're going to survive is if we seek some kind of peace. Luke chapter 14, don't lose your place in Joshua. That's where we're going to spend our time. Luke 14, 31, Jesus said, What king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else... While the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for conditions of peace. The Gibeonites, the Hivites, they met together and had a council. And they said, in effect, we know that the Israelites are coming and they're claiming this land, all of it, as theirs. We know they have been commissioned to either completely evict or annihilate us. We know that their God is a real God. He is powerful. Our gods are impotent. We need to find some way to seek peace. We need to negotiate because we can't beat them, so we need a, cover a covenant of peace. Now, how does this apply to you and me? Remember, Joshua's coming to take the promised land. Those that do not make a covenant of peace are doomed. Our Joshua, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yahshua. Our Joshua is coming to take back this world. It's his. It's been kidnapped by the enemy. And he has marching orders. All the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see him coming because the world is an enemy of God. We need to make a covenant of salvation now or we're doomed. You got the context of this story? How it applies to us? Jesus tells us in this parable, if you only have 10,000 and a king with 20,000 is coming, you better make peace. And he's got a lot more than 20,000, friends. Your army has no power against the armies of God. You better make peace. But the problem was they knew that the Israelites had been given a strict order by Moses not to enter into any covenant with the people of the land. Now they were allowed to make different covenants for trade with other surrounding nations, but nobody that lived within the borders of their possession. So, they came up with a very clever plan. Interesting story. But the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, and they worked craftily, and they went and they presented, pretended, I'm sorry, to be ambassadors, and they took, listen carefully, they took old sacks on their donkeys, probably skinny donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and clouded or patched sandals on their feet, old garments on their bodies, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. 
They did the opposite of most people would do as they prepare to make a trip. Most people, if you're getting ready to go on a long journey, you'd want everything, you'd want fresh bread and sturdy clothes. When I pack, I try to take stuff that I know can endure the trip, especially if, if I'm going overseas. I mean, I'm a fanatic. I make sure there's plenty of toothpaste in my tube because some countries don't have my toothpaste. <laughs> and you just want to have everything just right. And they go out of their way to actually totally misprepare for a trip. Dry and moldy bread. And they went to Joshua. Who does Joshua represent? Jesus. And they went to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, had a small assembly, and they probably looked pretty pitiful when they came hobbling into camp with their old donkeys and their old bread and torn rags and holy bags, and um, they began to present their case. And they said, we have come from a far country. Far country represents the lost condition. You remember where the prodigal son went? Where did he go? A far country. We've come from a far country. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you dwell among us. How can we make a covenant with you? You know, we're not supposed to make any covenants with the people living in our land. And they said to Joshua, we are your servants. First thing out of their mouth is, you don't have to fear us. We're here to serve you. They said to Joshua, we are your servants. Because you know what? It's better to serve and live than rebel and die. The central theme of my message today is we want to draw near to Joshua as servants. This is what they did. And then how did they argue their worthiness? Notice here, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? Now listen to their answer. So they said, we've come from a very far country. Our sins have separated us from God. There is a great gulf fixed. And Jesus crossed that gulf to save you and me. We are in a far country. And without his help, now they're describing the lost condition. You all with me? I'm hoping I'm not confusing you with these symbols. We have come from a very far country. Your servants have come because the name of the Lord your God, we are saved by the name of the Lord our God. For we have heard of his fame. We believe he's the real God. Isn't this what Rahab said? We know that your God is the real God. And all that he did in Egypt, we have evidence, we have faith that your God is the real God because of what's happened. And all he did to the two kings of the Amorites who are beyond the Jordan, Shihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who is at Asherah. Therefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country, you notice they never name their country. Far country. What is it? Our country. <laughs> Therefore, all the elders and inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey and go meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. They knew the only way they would be saved is by making a covenant. This bread of ours we took for our journey. We took for our provisions from our house on the day we departed to come to you. Behold, it was hot from the ovens. Now it's dry and moldy bread. And these wineskins that we filled were new. Now see, they're torn. And these are garments on our back. Now, probably torn and ratty. And our sandals have become old and clouded, the Bible says, because of the very long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions. They examined the evidence. They said, yeah, boy, those donkeys do look skinny. Can you imagine as they got ready? I mean, they're just across the mountain there. And as they got ready to make this trip, they said, find the oldest donkeys, find the worst sandals, find the rattiest clothes, torn wineskins, and that's what they pled to Joshua. They, in effect, were pleading their poverty. This was the criteria to make a covenant that would save them. Where did I leave off here? Verse 14, Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they didn't ask counsel of the Lord. If you're going to make a covenant, you better make sure you ask counsel of the Lord. 
And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant. And in the original language here, it implies they made a sacrifice. There was a sacrifice offered because all these covenants were sealed with blood. That sacrifice represents the blood of Christ. To let them live. How many of you want to live? Jesus came so that you can live. Unless you make a covenant with Joshua, you won't live. What is it that makes it possible for us to make this covenant by which we are saved? We plead not our goodness, but our badness. Now, I've taken each one of these symbols piece by piece, and I want you to consider them. What is it that gives them the criteria that they can make this covenant? If they had said, look how good we are, Joshua. We're healthy. We've got fat, strong donkeys. We've got new wineskins. We've got fresh, hot bread. They would have been doomed. If we come to Joshua pleading our goodness, you're dead. Are you with me? And a lot of people think, well, Lord's got to save me because after all, I pay tithe of all I got and I fast twice a week and I'm, we start to pray that pharisaical prayer. You're doomed if that's your approach to Joshua. Instead, they take a very humble approach. Old sacks, old wineskins, old patched sandals, old garments, dry moldy bread, far country, and skinny donkeys. Now look at these things. Old sacks. What does that mean? That their substance was cursed. In the lost condition, you're putting your money in pockets with holes. I remember one time vaguely my mom gave me like five dollars so that I could go up the street and eat out all by myself and it was more than I needed. And I got there and I ate and I reached into my pocket to pay and somewhere between my house and the restaurant that five dollar bill had slipped out through a hole in my pocket and I said to the cashier, woe is me. I am undone. <laughs> and she was very suspicious. It's an awful feeling to find out that you're putting your money in pockets with holes. Haggai chapter 1 verse 6, you've sown much and you bring in little. You eat but you don't have enough. You drink but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself but no one is warm and he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Until you're saved and your treasure's in heaven, you're storing everything in holy bags. You got, there's no substance in this world that will be uh, sustained. Everything is just, it's like all the grain is falling out through the holes in the back. Old wine skins. What does wine represent in the Bible? What's, you know this, what's it a symbol of? It's a symbol for the blood of Christ and a covenant. He said, this wine that I offer you was the new wine. He says, you don't put old wine in new wineskins. Jesus' gospel was new wine, new wineskins. Am I right? It's fresh. It's safe. It's not fermented and ratted and old. And those who do not know Joshua that are in that far country, what do they present? They're old patch wineskins leaking. That represents the false teachings. And you know what else is in old wineskins? Old wine. What is old wine? Fermented. That makes me think of Revelation 17. Babylon, what kind of wine does she have? Is it new wine? No, it says the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What kind of wine makes you drunk? Old wine. Fermented. It's talking about the doctrines, the covenants of the world. And they kept patching it. And you know, one of the things that is so strange and sad among the religions of the world is their doctrines are constantly changing. It's amazing. I don't want to be too critical, but it's amazing to me how many believe the secret rapture scenario for the second coming. That's really new. It's a teaching. Yeah, well, it's new and it's old. But it's just changing. The church didn't believe this 100 years ago. And the new concept of being filled with the Spirit that you must speak in tongues that seems to be sweeping so many of the ecumenical churches. If you had asked Wesley and Spurgeon 
and Finney and Calvin and Luther about that, they would have thought it was madness. It's constantly changing, like a ship with no anchor, floating around, patched wineskins. And that's what they present. Jesus said, you don't put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but you put new wine in new wineskins and both are preserved. What did they have on their feet? Old patched sandals. It uses the old English word clouted and that means mended. You know, uh, I remember once hiking through the desert with sandals on. Now, it's really smart if you're in the desert to have some kind of better protection on your feet, boots. And as a result of that, you are safer from the cactus and the thorns up there. But I thought I was tough. And so I was hiking once a long way from my cave at this time. My sandals broke. I know a friend, he actually was worse off. He was crossing a creek in the desert, the only creek out there, and it was spring runoff and he dropped his shoes. He didn't want to get his shoes wet. He dropped them and he had to hike the rest of the way on the hot burning rocks and cactus barefoot. But I just tore my sandals and I don't remember exactly what I did, but I tried to engineer them back together and repair them and wrap something around them to keep it on my foot. And not only was it uncomfortable and not only did it blister me, I had to kind of limp and shuffle as I went to keep it on my foot. So it slows your progress. Your shoes represent your walk. They had old patched sandals. Their walk was a limping, hesitating walk. It was a painful walk. You know, it's interesting, the Bible tells us that when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, the sandals that they left Egypt with I've led you 40 years in the wilderness and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. I've got some shoes that I bought for Sabbath shoes 20 years ago and they're so out of style now because they won't wear out. <laughs> Matter of fact, they're sort of the high heel boots they were wearing in the 70s and they were free and so I still wear them when the weather's real cold. They're coming back into style again. Danny wears boots. It must be okay. <laughs> but he said, your shoes never wore out. I wonder if God's given me a little message. My Sabbath shoes never wear out. But those of us who are trying to walk in the world, we're wearing old clouded sandals. Our walk is hindered. It's crippled. It's hobbled. We need to put on those shoes of the gospel that it talks about there in Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have good shoes, not only don't you walk well, you can't fight well. It's very important if you're going to be fighting that you have traction. Amen? You're wearing those old ratty clouded sandals. You can't fight the enemy. So what are they pleading? They're pleading to Joshua. Look at our feet. Our walk is hindered. Have you sometimes prayed to Jesus and said, Lord, I'm so sorry that my walk is a crippled walk. We need to come to our Jesus and ask him to cobble us some new shoes. Amen? Amen. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those that preach the gospel. They're wearing gospel shoes. Oh, and by the way, when the prodigal son drew near to Joshua, not only did he give him a robe and that signet ring, it said, and put sandals on his feet. What kind of sandals do you think he had? the best sandals. Amen? And as you draw near to the Lord, He gives you those new sandals. What about their garments? He says, these garments of ours, they've become old because of the journey. What does that represent? All of our righteousness is filthy rags. We come to our Jesus, our Joshua, with rags. You don't come pleading your good fancy clothes. That's one more argument for humility among Christians in our attire. It doesn't mean you have to wear rags, but it means we should be humble in our attire. Amen? We come to Him and we plead, our righteousness is filthy rags. I love the story in the Bible where Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. And there's just a little note in there where when he's crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. This is Mark chapter 10. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus calls him. What kind of clothes do you think an old beggar wore? I mean, he doesn't even see the stains on his clothes, does he? But for some reason, when Jesus said, 
bring him to me. It says, casting away his garment, he came to Jesus. And when we come to Christ, we need to cast away our old filthy self-righteousness. What do we have to plead? Our rags? I remember hearing an interesting story from history. You know, I love studying. Um, I have to come up with amazing facts every week for the radio program. And I remember reading about one of these lost heroes of the great explorers. His name was Alvar Nunes Cabeza de Vaca. His name actually means cow's head, Cabeza de Vaca. But he had an epic journey. He was actually one of the first people besides the natives to discover Texas and northern Mexico. Began with an expedition that landed in Florida somewhere near Tampa, 300 men. Got beat up by a hurricane, sick, attacked by Indians, problems with the food and, and disease, and they realized, and their ships left them there. Said they'd come back and they never did. And they realized, you know, if we have any hope, we're going to have to try and get back on our own. And they tried to fabricate these boats that were made out of the local wood and horse hide. They had brought some horses with them. So they, about 40 of them survived out of 300 and got into these makeshift rafts. Storm came up and sank out of the five rafts, three of them. Now there's only two left. Some of them managed to survive and make it to Galveston and now they were down to eight. And when they arrived at Galveston, after, oh, a year and a half of basically just living a very Spartan existence there along the Gulf Coast trying to survive and make their way back to Mexico, their condition was so pitiful that the enemies that normally would have killed them, they came to the, embassy, the, the um, natives there that were on the Galveston Island, and these men were starving, they were sick, they are wearing rags, and... Cabeza de Vaca, when he records later the story, he says, the Indians looked at us and they sat down and they wept at our condition that people could be so destitute. And they said, we're going to let you live and we'll feed you, but you're going to become our slaves. And the Indians made them their slaves. Well, eventually four of them survived, managed to escape their slavery and it's just an epic journey. You ought to read about it sometime. Finally made it back to Mexico City, all the way from Tampa, Florida. And it's just an incredible story. But I, I always thought about their condition was so low that instead of killing them, the Indians wept and saved them, but they made them their slaves. That plays into our story. It goes on to say they had old garments. All of us are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming for a church that's wearing what? The wedding garment that he's provided without spot or wrinkle. How does the Lord get the spots and the wrinkles out? How do you get your spots out? Is it uh, hot water? Hot iron? It's the blood of Christ. And don't miss the point, it is through fiery trials that we are purified. So when God brings you through different trials, don't chafe under the hand that holds the chisel, but let him turn you into a jewel. Amen. Say, Lord, I don't know what you're teaching me, but it's through the fiery trials the gold is purified. It is through the hot water and the hot iron that the spots and the wrinkles are eliminated. And we need to allow the Lord through the blood of Christ to cleanse us and through the trials. Old garments, dry, moldy bread. I can again picture them before they left there. The Hivite said, find the worst bread you can find. And so they not only got bread that was moldy, but in the original, I understand, it looked like it was riddled with worms as well. And they said, this is our bread. It was hot from our ovens when we left. Now look at it. You know, I, going back to my love for history, you read about what some of these sailors had to eat when they crossed the ocean. And the bread would get so bad. And it would get, it would get moldy and worm-ridden, but they'd get so hungry, they'd eat it anyway. And there's a lot of people in the world, and even some in the church, that are eating 
old, dry, moldy, wormy bread. And you think, well, Pastor Doug, I'm glad that's not me. You know, the children of Israel, if they tried to save their manna overnight except Friday, it bred worms and it stunk. Some of you who are watching, who are listening, you are trying to survive spiritually by living today on the bread you ate yesterday. Have I been uh, emphasizing how important it is to have a daily devotional life with the Lord? Are you accepting the challenge to read your Bibles every day? Spend time, quality time with the Lord on your knees. Not only, I hope you're praying as families. We have family worship every day before the kids go to school, before they go to bed at night, we pray together. And then Karen and I hold hands and pray together every night before we go to bed, even if we're really mad at each other, <laughs> which isn't very often. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Amen? Amen. You pray together. Family that prays together stays together. You've heard that before. But beyond your family worship, and I hope you have family worship, you need private devotions with the Lord, just you and Jesus with your Lord. And so the bread was dry and moldy and wormy. That also represents the food that a lot of the lost eat, feeding on the media and the religion of the world. Wormy bread. And we've got a lot of good preachers in our church, in our denomination, but I know that we sometimes get a little dry bread too. Uh, even Pastor Doug fires blanks every now and then. And uh, that's why you've got to know how to get your bread from Jesus. Amen? I love the story in the Bible about when Christ multiplied the bread. Look at how it happened. All they found was a little bit. So if you're reading your Bible, you say, you know, I, I, I'm reading it, but I'm not getting much, but I get a little bit. And you take the verse that touches you. And then before you read your Bible, pray. These words are spirit and life. It's not just ink on white paper. I'd say, Lord, this is a supernatural book. These words are spirit and life. Bring them to life. And you know what you're doing? You're taking your little loaf and your fishes and you're giving it to Jesus. He blesses it, the Bible says. He blessed what the disciples gave him and he gave it back. He blessed it and gave it back and not only were they able to feed others, but they ate. This is how the devotional life works. The reason that you are having private devotions every day is not just so you'll get something. It's so you have something to give others who are hungry. In the Great Judgment, Matthew 25, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. And he declares, I like to emphasize what he says to those that are saved, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was a stranger and, and you took me in. And they'll say, Lord, when did we see you in any of these six conditions I identified? He said, and as much as you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it to me. Enter into the joy of the Lord. All these things, the food and the water, the alienation, the sickness, the imprisonment, the nakedness. This represents the suffering of the world. And he says, inasmuch as you did it, wanted to the least of these. And because we do it to someone else, we're doing it for Christ. They will hear the Lord say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Why does the Lord give us the new clothes and the fresh bread and all of these things? The new wine, the new shoes. Is it just for ourselves or is it so we can serve and minister to others? You know, just staying with that parable for a moment longer, I studied those six conditions. Hungry and you gave me food. Naked, you clothed me. Thirsty, gave me drink. Stranger, you took me in. Sick, you came to me. In prison, and you visited me. Six conditions. One for each day of the week other than the Sabbath, right? The working days? What kind of days? The working days. Because this is the work of the church. Not only are we to literally feed the hungry, but the people are hungering for the bread of life. We are to feed the bread of life. Not only are people thirsty, but we're to give them the living water. Not only are people naked and they need clothes, and we're thankful for those of you that work with what was once called the Dorcas Society as a community service, but the people are naked and they need the righteous robe of Christ. We are to dispense that. Not only are we to care for the strangers, but people are alienated from God 
and we are to introduce them to the Lord. Not only is it true that people are sick and we should go to the hospitals and visit them there and we should have a good medical work, but people are sick in sin. The Bible describes sin as a sickness from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot and it's not a pretty picture. Full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores is how Isaiah describes the sickness of sin. And we are to give them the balm from Gilead. Amen? Amen. And not only are people in prison and praise God for the prison ministry, but people are imprisoned by sin. And we should work with Christ to set the captives free. These conditions I just described are the condition of a lost world, something like the Gibeonites, the way they pled their poverty to Joshua. Bear with me, I want to take that thought just a little further. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, it occurred to me one day that he embraced all of those things. When Jesus was on the cross, he was hungry. Was he hungry? All he ate was a ceremonial Passover meal 24 hours earlier. And a, they, he had spent a lot of energy with all the beating and the cross and things. Was he thirsty? Are we guessing this? Or did he say, I thirst? Was he naked? They stripped him, gambled for his clothes. That's all he had. I think it's interesting. The only thing Jesus left behind was his clothes, symbolizing that he came to this world. What do we know about the possessions of Jesus? Well, we know he had a robe without seam. Amen? A seamless robe. He left behind his righteousness. Probably it was a blood-stained robe because they whipped him and put it back on. He was naked that you and I might be clothed. Was he in prison? Can you be any more in prison than being nailed by your hands and feet and suspended between heaven and earth? Was he a stranger? Came unto his own and his own received him not. They didn't know who he was. All of these conditions of the lost world. And was he sick? How do you think you'd feel? Being beaten, dehydrated, spit on, crucified. You'd feel pretty sick. When Christ described, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was naked, I was in prison, I was sick, I was a stranger. When he describes those things, he's describing the suffering of the world that he took on the cross. You and I are to go out and relieve the suffering. Stay with me. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. And one of the subcategories for that, you might say God is omnipathic. Sympathy, pathos, it means to feel. Does the Lord feel everything? Because he knows everything, does he know how you feel? Does the Lord know when the little tummy on the little sparrow is empty and he feeds the sparrow? Does the Lord know everything? How many agree the Lord knows and everything? Does that mean he feels everything? How much suffering is in our world today? Just think about it. Think if you could take all the suffering and trials that are in this room and coalesce that and melt that down into one cup. Who would want to drink that? Think about all the suffering and misery and pain in the world. Christ took all that on the cross. Does the Lord feel the suffering of the world? So, anything you do to relieve the suffering of any man, woman, child, boy, girl, dog, or cat, does the Lord feel the relief? When you give a drink of water to a thirsty child and that child feels the relief from that fresh, cool water, well, the Lord had felt the thirst before. Now he feels the relief, doesn't he? I know I don't want to get into pantheism. I'm not talking about that. This is just clean theology, that God is feeling the misery of this creation that's groaning and travailing in pain. And anything you and I do to relieve the suffering of this miserable world Jesus feels it. So when he said, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me, it wasn't just a metaphor. Every opportunity we have to do good to our fellow men, to serve, Jesus feels that. He really does. And we, when we neglect those opportunities, are missing an opportunity to do it unto Jesus. And we might be among those who will hear him say, depart from me, ye cursed, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels because in as much as you did not do it to me, 
or did not do it to them, you did not do it to me, did not do it to the least of them. I'm not done with what they pled to Joshua. I just got distracted by my own voice. <laughs> Dry moldy bread. Why do you spend your money? Isaiah 55, 2, for that which is not bread. Jesus wants to give you fresh bread. How many of you like nice, hot, fresh bread? Dripping with cholesterol. <laughs> Number six, they'd come from a far country. We are separated from God by our sins. Christ is the ladder that reaches from heaven to earth. He spanned this distance. I think it's significant in the Bible that it says that the Lord crossed the sea. Many times he crossed the sea and then he'd save somebody. We talked about when he crossed the sea and then he healed that girl who had died. He crossed the sea and he healed the demoniac. Christ crossed the sea of the cosmos, the universe, and came to our world. We were in a far country, but he came to where we are to save us. Amen? And their donkeys, weak, skinny, their poor little legs were probably shaking. In the Bible, the beast, the donkey, represented strength. You remember when the Good Samaritan found that man who had fallen among thieves, left him half dead, naked, wounded, again, describing the lost condition. He came to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in wine and oil, a symbol for the covenant we've just talked about, and the Holy Spirit. I think he probably wrapped up his wounds by tearing up his own clothes. He's like Christ. And it says he put him on his own beast. The man had no strength. He needed outside help to get from point A to point B. You and I cannot get to heaven. We cannot do God's will without supernatural strength. Amen? We learned about that from Samson last night. Now, here's the question. When they come to Joshua and they make a covenant with them, do you think Joshua says, okay, head on home? Or did he say, well, not only will we make a covenant with you, but those covenants were always followed by a feast. Even the Passover is followed by a meal. I think they said, look, we're going to give you, you can't go home like this. We're going to give you new wineskins, new wine, new clothes, healthy donkeys, right? New shoes, fresh bread. I think he f supplied all of their practical needs as well as he made a covenant with them. And then they said to Joshua, make a covenant with us, a compact made by sacrifice. Deuteronomy 29, verse 12. Enter into a covenant with the Lord your God. 2 Chronicles 29, verse 10. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath might turn away from us. We need to make a covenant with our Joshua who is coming to this land that his wrath might turn away. Those who don't make a covenant are going to flee before the wrath of the Lamb. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? This is our only hope, friends. What is it that we plead in order to make this covenant? Do we plead our goodness? What is it that qualifies us? Friends, this is good news. This tells us about the grace of the Lord. What was it that they said? We got great clothes, we got fresh bread, we got strong donkeys. Or did they say, we are unworthy? We are weak, we are poor, we are wretched, we are miserable, we are blind, we are naked, and we are pleading what is our most eloquent prayer that we can offer for our salvation. It's the prayer of the Gibeonites. Make a covenant with us. Look at our condition. We have nothing to plead. We are presenting the evidence of a far country. There in us is no good thing. This is good news. You know why? Because it means every one of you qualify unless you're pleading your goodness. It's not our goodness that makes us qualified. It's our badness. Because Jesus did not come to save those that are well. He came to save those that are sick. Do you know that you're sick? We've got this sickness. This is good news. And he makes a covenant. Now, it's interesting as you read on in the story, soon, it says after three days, they find out they've been duped. After three days. It's the resurrection. Verse 16. I'm still in chapter 9 of Joshua. And it happened at the end of three days after they, made, after they made the covenant. They heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt near them. 
And the children of Israel came to the cities of Gibeon on the third day, and they didn't know what to do. The people murmured against Israel, and the congregation murmured against the rulers. They said, you entered into a contract with this city and this nation we're supposed to destroy, but what are we going to do? And the rulers said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now we may not touch them. It's like that blood they put over the door when the angel of death came through. Protection. It's like the red rope in the house of Rahab. Protection. You and I are protected by a promise made by God. This is the gospel. He is making a covenant with us that we are forgiven and we are saved. That's good news. I'm excited. You don't look excited. I get excited by the word, even while I'm preaching it. It touches my heart. We may not touch them. And say, well, what do we do then? We've got to let them live. But the only way they're going to live is as our servants. This we will do. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath we have sworn to them. And the ruler said to them, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for the congregation, as the rulers have promised to them. They were saved to serve. Woodcutters and water carriers. You know, the gospel is involved in the fire. You needed the wood to keep the fire burning. And the gospel is involved in the water. In the temple, there were two things in the courtyard that dealt with justification. You had water flowing from the laver for washing, and you had fire burning in the altar. Unless you are born of the fire and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do you see the symbolism here? The Gibeonites became perpetual servants in the house of the Lord to keep that water cleansing people and to keep that fire consuming the sacrifices. This describes the condition of the church. You and I are saved, but we are saved to serve in the house of God to keep the water flowing. That's baptism. And to keep the fire burning. That's the gospel. Justification by faith in the sacrifice of Christ. You can be saved, but you can only be saved on one condition, friends. You plead your poverty, and you're willing to serve in the house of God. There are some people who want the salvation covenant, and they don't have a problem pleading their poverty, but they don't want to serve. God has saved us all to serve. In the world, we often measure success by how many work for us. And I'm sometimes tinged with conviction because someone will ask me about amazing facts. I'll say, yeah, we've got this many employees. And the Holy Spirit says, Doug, you sound like you're bragging that you're successful because here you're the president and you've got this many people working in the office. And, and I'm convicted by that because in God's economy, that doesn't make you the highest. That makes you the lowest. Isn't that right? In God's economy, he who is the servant of all, he is the greatest. And yet many want to come to the church and they want the salvation, but they don't want to serve. Keep the water flowing. You're to draw water and you are to keep the fire burning. Being a servant for the Lord. You know, Christ came not as a Lord, but as a minister. Jesus came. He says, I am among you as one that serves. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 52, these prophecies about Christ, one of the identifying names, the title for Christ is, Behold, my servant. He will deal prudently. He will be exalted and be extolled and be very high. My righteous servant will justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Christ came as a servant. Luke 22, verse 27, For who is greater, he that sits at the table or he that serves? It's not he that sits at the table. Yet I am among you, Christ said, as one that serves. Jesus came to serve. At the Last Supper, how did he reiterate this? He got down at the disciples' feet, a position of humility, and he washed their feet. He said, I am among you as one who serves. Jesus came to serve. And if we are his followers, is the servant greater than the master? And if the master came to serve, so Joshua said, all right, I'm going to save you, but I'm saving you to serve, and you're to serve in the house of the Lord. Well, I'll tell you, friends, I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God to live in the tents of iniquity with all the treasures of the world. 
And you and I are hoping that we can be servants in his house. The Bible says even in heaven, those before his throne praise him. Revelation 7, 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. This is the Gibeonites, the Hivites, serving God, keeping the water flowing and the fire burning. You know, this is really your ministry. You accept salvation like the Gibeonites. You plead that we are unworthy and God says, okay, I'm going to let you live, but you've got a job to do. Are you willing to live? Yes, I want to live. Okay, then pick up your bucket. Bring some water to the laver. They probably hauled it from the Jordan River. Isn't that right? A symbol of uh, baptism. And get your axe and go to the woods and keep that fire burning the sacrifices. You and I, if we are saved, we must be involved in the church serving. You know, I saw an amazing fact I thought was interesting online. Some of you maybe have been to Rome, you've been to the Vatican. How many of you have heard of the Swiss Guard? And it may seem strange to you that the Vatican has an army, even though they're an independent country, they're not Italian soldiers. They're Swiss soldiers. It goes back 500 years this year. I forget the name of the Pope, but he was impressed with the courage and the dignity and the valor of the Swiss soldiers. And so from that time in 1506 to the present day for 500 years now, the guards that have been commissioned to guard the Pope, and they lay down their lives to guard him. They are the ones who uh, guard him. Here it is. They're called Defenders of the Church's Freedom. They're from the Helvetian soldiers, renowned for their courage and their valor. And it's considered a great honor if you're chosen from among the Swiss soldiers in, Sw in uh, Switzerland to say, I'm going to go to the Vatican. I am among the Swiss guard. It's considered an honor guard to serve in that temple. Now, don't take that analogy too far. But you and I have an opportunity to be among God's honor guard, to be gatekeepers in the temple of God. And wouldn't that be even better than the Vatican? Amen. That you and I can serve in the church of God. So when we are called to be servants of the Lord, it requires courage. It's an honor. It's not something that is degrading. How do you identify yourself? By how many work for you or how many you serve? How did Paul identify himself? I'm Paul, the great apostle. I perform miracles. I work wonders. Or did he say Paul, the servant? Matter of fact, he uses the words, the slave of Jesus Christ. He understood this principle. And by the way, it is through service we are prepared to lead. How did the Lord prepare Joseph for ministry? Before you could lead, you've got to serve. Made him a servant. Slave in the prison, working for Potiphar. How did Moses prepare for his great work? Took care of his father-in-law's sheep. And David took care of his father's sheep. How do you and I prepare for service? Be content to take care of our father's sheep. Not be too big. God will, has no problem using people who are too little, but he can't use people that are too big. Are you willing to serve? Now here's the good news. The other nations... When they heard the Gibeonites had made a covenant with Joshua and they were going to be spared, they thought this is treason. They've left our confederacy. So the five other nations that had not yet been conquered, they all got together and instead of attacking Joshua, they said, we're going to attack the servants, now the Gibeonites. And that's exactly how it is. When you accept Jesus, you become an enemy of the world. And when they came to attack the Gibeonites, these five nations, we're going to annihilate them because they'd made a covenant with Joshua. The devil is wroth with a woman and he goes to make war with those who have made a covenant with Joshua, our Jesus. They send a message to Joshua and they say, we're under attack. You've made a covenant with us. We're your servants. You've got to save us. Boy, the audacity of them. Now you would think that the Israelites would say, well, it serves you right. You deceived us. Let them have you. But you know what? Is that what Joshua said? He said, no, we've made a covenant. You are our servants. You've been doing your job. We're going to put our lives on the line to defend you. And Joshua came to deliver them. If we are found serving when Jesus comes, our Joshua will come to deliver us. Amen? Why do we want to serve God? 
so that we can be spared? Well, that's a good starting point, but ultimately, why do we want to serve him? It says, I'll serve you because I love you. He laid down his life for us. We've made a covenant with him. He didn't offer a lamb. He offered himself. Do you think you could serve Jesus? Do you want to make a covenant? Do you want to say today, Lord, I love you, and I want to be a servant? Is that your desire? Listen as John sings, and we'll have prayer together. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, not of this world's delusive dreams. I have renounced all sinful pleasure for Jesus is mine and there's nothing between nothing between my soul and my Savior though this world against me convenes watching I remember hearing a story years ago when these wagon trains were still crossing the west. Someone stopped at the local station to buy a ticket passage on this stagecoach. And as he was in there, he saw the price list up on the wall that said uh, first class $2 and second class $1, third class 50 cents. And right about then the stagecoach pulled up and he looked out and he saw everybody hopping out all sitting together, first class, third class, second class, all in the same compartment. He thought, well, I'm not a fool. Why buy a first class ticket? They all ride together. So he thought he was pretty shrewd. He said, I want a third class ticket. Pretty soon he got on board. He started on his journey. Felt very proud of himself that he had saved so much money until they got to the first hill. And the stagecoach driver said, uh, okay, Second class passengers, you need to get out and walk. First class passengers, you can remain seated. Third class, get out and push. <laughs> and I like that story because it bears out the truth that church has too many third class passengers. We come once a week. We have just enough religion to fool ourselves, but it's not going to be enough to fool the Lord. Are you a servant? Are you willing to serve with Jesus? You know, in the song that John just sang, it says, Though the whole world against me convene, when the Gibeonites made that covenant with Joshua, what did they do? They pled their poverty, and then everybody came against them. He will come to our defense. We will be saved by our Joshua. Can you say amen? amen. But you need to make a covenant with him. When you came in, you had a decision card. I'd like to ask you to do something with that. You should have had one in your seat. Please reach for that. You can also find these online if you're watching online or even the churches. Some of you are prepared with these. We want to have prayer for you. And by the way, you can put your prayer requests on the back. Please take your decision card and allow me to ask you these questions. I'd like to encourage you to make a decision about accepting the gospel. Make a covenant with Jesus today. You don't have to plead your goodness. In fact, the best plea you have, the most eloquent plea, is your need, your badness. We have ushers here in the hall. If you don't have one of these cards, hold your hand up and they'll bring it to you. Please write your name, your address on here. And this is also for those who are watching. First question. I choose to commit, perhaps for the first time, or maybe you've drifted away and you want to recommit your life to Jesus. Is that your desire? Check that box, please. Second line. I'd like to dedicate time each day to prayer and Bible study. I hope everybody will check that. Make a covenant today to get to know the Lord. Get some fresh bread. Amen. 
Some of you have been visiting and watching and you're from other religious persuasions or you don't understand the sponsoring denomination is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You'd like to know more about the church, just get some information. Nobody will hassle you, but we'll be happy to provide that. Please check that box. Some of you maybe realize the need to get a new beginning. You haven't accepted Jesus and now you are and you wonder what's next, do I need to be baptized? Maybe you've drifted into that far country and you're coming home. You may need rebaptism. I want you to pray about this. Check that box if that's your desire. Baptism or rebaptism. I'll give you a moment to fill out these cards as John sings another verse and then we'll close with prayer. Nothing between my soul and my Savior so that he may be seen nothing preventing the least of his pleasure keep the way clear let nothing be to right now I invite you to come just as you are we're going to pray not plead our goodness, we're gonna plead our poverty. And then we come away from that covenant, you are a servant in the house of God. That's the deal, friends, do you accept that? And then he changes your heart, he changes your life. He gives you new shoes and new clothes and new water. Loving Lord, thank you for this story in the Bible that so beautifully illustrates that we can make a covenant with our coming Joshua and be spared in that day we are willing, Lord, to embrace the terms that we are servants in your house. Keep the fire burning, the water flowing, first of all in our own lives and then in those of those around us. Bless these people. If there's anything in their hearts that are obscuring Christ, save us from our sins so there is nothing between our soul and the Savior. Pour out your spirit. Help this revival to be real and lasting. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.